Hey, it's Jim, and this is FRM Part 2, the topic on operational risk and resilience, and the chapter on a case study, cyber threats and information security risks. The very first sentence in this chapter is an obvious one. It reads something like, cyber risks and information security risks have been super important over the last decade. But the second sentence really caught my eye. Uh, there was a survey done, and that second sentence suggests that operational risks are top of mind for bank managers and those who run financial institutions. And so I, I had this thought, you know, what have we talked about here? And what do we know are the major risks associated with, uh, with being in the banking industry? You know, you got market risks, you have liquidity risks, you have interest rate risk. And then, you know, what we've been talking about here for a while is this concept of operational risk. And so I'm guessing these major events that have occurred, uh, you know, over the last decade or so have really elevated, elevated not just general information security threats, but all operational risk threats to, to and top of mind is a phrase that the, uh, that the reading does use. So look at these two learning objectives. Uh, skip to the second one. We'll take a quick look at the Equifax case study. And the LO asks us to describe the lessons learned. So we have the very last slide is going to cover that, uh, that learning objective. But that first one is going to take us a little bit of time to get through. We'll be able to provide examples of cyber threats and information security risks. You probably don't need to read this, uh, this chapter to kind of uh, provide those examples. But I think the great exam questions are describe frameworks and then best practices. A lot of this is going to be uh, super simple common sense. Let me give you just a quick personal example. When I was about 12 years old, uh, I was a baseball player and I bought a new bat. And I remember spending $5 on this bat. And $5 back in those days uh, was uh, a lot of money. I took my bat to a game and uh, I used it. And boy, I'd like to tell you I hit a home run, but I really can't remember. But somebody else used it and broke it. And I was devastated. And I took the bat home uh, to my mother and maybe I was in tears. And I said, Mom, look what somebody did to my bat. And my mother looked at me uh, in those loving eyes that she always did and said, well, you know, if you didn't want it broken, you should not have taken it to the game. And my initial thought was, how could my mother be so cruel? Isn't she supposed to love me? But clearly, clearly my mother knew what she was talking about. And that's exactly the commonsensical kinds of practices that we're going to examine inside of this reading. But we're not going to examine just our common sense and our experience. We're going to rely on some really, really smart men and women from some international organizations, and you'll see that in just a little bit. So let's go ahead and start with uh, some examples. And as I'm going through this reading, I'm trying to determine what kind of, what kind of exam questions would I create. And it seems to me like this first part of the reading is really an emphasis on whether whether these risks are caused either internally or externally, whether they are intentional or unintentional. There's a really cool statistic in the beginning of the reading that uh, nearly a majority of internal risks and events are unintentional. You know, people just forget to do stuff like, uh, how many times do you forget to change your password? You know, at our school, we get an email. It seems like every day, don't forget to change your password. And I don't, I don't do it every day, but maybe, maybe I should. Probably not every day at a, at a college. All right, so what is information security risk? Look at that first arrow point. Misuse, unauthorized access or theft of confidential data or information, so internal or external. And the chapter then puts together just a little bit of a table here, and this is pretty self-explanatory. Uh, notice what we're doing, a little matrix where we have external causes or, or maybe third, third parties. Now remember, remember that we, we have this relationship with the third party, so that they, they technically are external. But remember how we talked about how whatever best practices uh, that we employ, we need to hire third parties and have our pra best practices extend in to their operations. We don't want to hire somebody. I mean, if we have this much, uh, if they, we have this much in 
uh, in our practice, best practice, we don't want to hire somebody who has this much as a, as a third party, right? So look at the internal and the external, and uh, you know you can go through these here: digital attacks, physical attacks, transfer of data, mishandling, proprietary information, disruptions, disasters, physical losses, digital losses. So the exam question here is probably going to be just tell us the relationship between something internal or something external. Now, the next section in this chapter takes a look at a couple of high profile examples. This one is called the Panama Papers because the uh, hacker was from Panama, or at least they were released from Panama. So there was a law firm in Panama in which they had confidential files. Look at this, emails, contracts, client lists, financial spreadsheets, and all sorts of other documents, probably in there, some, you know, some tax documents. And so, you know, think about it. if you're someone like, uh, you know, uh, somebody famous, you know, whether it's a sports star or a politician uh, or, or a movie star or just some really wealthy uh, entrepreneur, and you've hired this uh, Panama law firm and all of a sudden all of your stuff is, uh, is out in the public. Now, what the Panama Papers here, and then we're going to talk about the Paradise Papers here in just a second, what, what these two high profile data hacks, you know, pretty much illustrated to the just the general public, but in more specifically to the investing public, is that lots and lots of wealthy individuals and organizations, they like to use hidden offshore accounts. And those hidden offshore accounts, they're, they're not illegal. Of course, they're legal. Um, however, they, are, uh, they have been shown to be excellent ways to avoid paying taxes, to minimize tax liabilities, to launder uh, money, and to just hide assets. Um, you know, you can just pick up uh, you know, any kind of a newspaper and, and somewhere in that newspaper, you guys don't even read newspapers anymore, go to any web page and you'll find, oh, here's a celebrity divorce and these two people, they love each other for, you know, 10 minutes or however long it is and they're getting a divorce and they have massive assets. Well, you can envision a scenario under which one party would want to hide some of the assets uh, of the other party. And so uh, these Panama Papers, uh, 11.5 million confidential files. Um, and so what you can do is you can actually go out and, uh, and read the Panama Papers if you want to. It's not very exciting. I actually tried to do it, but, uh, you know, I was about seven seconds into it and I thought, I'm, I'm not going to I'm not going to do this. <laughs> uh, the Paradise Papers, uh, super similar example. This is another law firm. Uh, confidential documents. This was uh, over 13.4 million people. And, you know, look, there's some companies there, Apple, Nike, and Uber. There's some implicated politicians. There's one really super famous politician who, who I won't name, but you could probably find out uh, uh, pretty quickly. So look at what we have in the bold there. Offshore tax havens to legally reduce taxes and engage in potentially illegal um, activities. And so swinging back to that, here, let me go back here to, you know, this, this learning objective, provide examples of cyber threats and information security risks. And so these two examples really just show us that, you know what, when we trust these law firms, and it doesn't have to be a law firm, it could be a financial institution, of course, when we trust them with our financial scenarios, we've got to give them private information. And so we kind of just assume, we just assume that they're going to take the necessary actions. But of course, there are individuals who take their $5 baseball bat to a game and then go home crying, crying to their mother. Now, remember I said that a lot of this is common sense. But what the, what the association does here is they say something like, look, let's go to the experts. And so there are a handful of experts that we're going to look at over the next couple of slides. So here's the U.S. National Institute of Standards and Technology Framework. So who are these people? So these are really, really smart men and women who have developed a set of standards and best practices for things like water systems and nuclear power plants and hospitals and other healthcare institutions. And so that was pretty much the motivation 
uh, the NIST. And you can look at that little illustration there over on the right, and that's pretty much what they do. And I, I'm going to do this here in just a second, but those uh, those five action words there, those are probably really good sources of questions. But notice what we put in, in red there. Of course, these best practices can then be applied to financial institutions as well. And that's probably why GARP has gone ahead and included that in here. So what we have over the next couple of slides here, let me do this just really quickly. So notice we have the function there's identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover, and then some categories. But what I wanted to do here on this slide is just go into these, you know, relatively quickly. Uh, you know, what is identify? We've talked about this before, you know, identify the risks. But what this chapter suggests is in the first step of identifying the risk is just to go ahead and make a list of all of the assets associated with the business that might have some ability to be compromised. Make a list of all equipment, make a list of all software, make a list of all laptops, make a list of all modems, make a list, make a list, you know, of all the stuff that's out there that somebody can, uh, that somebody can uh, worm their way into our system. And then using that list, create a cybersecurity policy. So that's all part of the identify. And I think that's super important. What comes out of that identification is not just a list of, okay, what could go wrong, but also, but also a policy that says something like, okay, look, you know, here we have this particular risk and then we've got this particular response. And notice that we have respond in, uh, in one of these action words. Uh, protect, of course, with protection, you're probably going to follow some protocols. And I mentioned this just a little bit ago, you know, control the login process. You know, when, when I go teach in, uh, I have, I teach in three different classrooms this semester. And every time I go in there and have to log in and I got to, you know, do the password and do all, pass all the security. And if I have my laptop with me, I got to do it on the laptop. So our school is probably on, on top of all this. So control the log in process. Um, use software to protect the data, uh, encrypt any sensitive data, uh, back up all the data, update all the software. And then inside of that protection is what we've talked about in many recordings, train, 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 you know, make certain that the employees are trained in not only all of the steps and the protocols of protection, but also backwards up into the identify, like, okay, what did I just say? You know, I have this computer in one of our classrooms and then if I have my laptop, you know, so that's two different ways that are subject to compromise. Uh, detect, this is exactly what you might suggest, you know, make certain that we know who is using all of these. So we check for unauthorized access. And um, one of the interesting things about the chapter is that it specifically mentions, you know, I'm not going to pull up my, uh, I'm not going to pull up my other PC. Of course, I have a Mac here so I could reach around, but, you know, I, you know, I could plug in a USB, you know, a flash drive or a disc or whatever it is. As soon as I plug that thing in, who knows what's on that disc, who knows uh, where it's going to go and all that kind of stuff. And of course, that that uh, that flash drive, you know, if it has wireless capability, it can talk to uh, it can talk to my neighbors. Respond this is exactly what it suggests. This is all part of that cybersecurity policy that I was talking about earlier. If these things happen, if Jim goes into the classroom and he leaves his laptop in the room and he's already logged into his account, well, then the students and, you know, some students uh, some students are the smartest people out there. The students could go into my grading system and say, oh, oh, it looks like I made a 20 out of 100 on that last test. How about if I change that to an 80? And I, I, how would I know? I mean, I might know. I might figure it out sooner or later. But, uh, you know, so that response is how do we do that? And then the recover is, you know, what has happened to the system? Do I need to get Jim a new laptop? Do I need to do something else? Replace equipment, restore equipment. And so the recover is probably, is probably a part of over here on the protect where we had all those protocols and so when we recover, we maybe need to new, get new software, new hardware, whatever that is. So I think these are good 
exam questions, those five in the circle, but then the chapter goes on to split these into 22 additional categories. And so I covered most of these things here, but what I'm gonna have you do now is just get out your phone and take a picture of this one and take a picture of this one. Notice the questions down the left-hand side. I think these are really good potential exam questions. Process and that sets, safeguards, techniques, uh, and more and more techniques. Uh, notice we've color coded them so that you can uh, so that you can actually memorize these things uh, uh, for the exam. All right, let's move on to another organization here, the Center for Internet Security. This is a not-for-profit company that was uh, created sometime uh, in the early 2000s. And it's exactly what the name suggests. It's an international coalition of really, really smart men and women who provide, you know, some kind of a framework. So best practices, notice on that second teardrop point, map to legal, regulatory, and policy frameworks. That's a really good point there. Uh, we've talked about this regularly, and this, this, is, this is across all sorts of industries. This mapping is super important. So we identify the risk, and then we map it to some type of equipment or software or individual or organization, and then we can map it over here, and we can do all sorts of mapping. And so uh, those critical security controls uh, are mapped then to, you know, let me go back here real quick. They're mapped to, whoops, I needed to go back, mapped to this uh, this circle. And you could probably throw some other things in, into that circle as well. So what's the goal? Aims to detect and stop the most prevalent cyber attacks against networks and systems. So as you can imagine, if, if, if uh, students change their grades on my laptop because I left it there, and then I pick up the phone and I call uh, the CIS and I say, hey, here's one of our failures. So they record this and they have uh, uh, experts and they say, well, Jim, you know, you should have not done this and this and this. So then they use that to be able to go out to other colleges. And of course, this applies to, uh, to financial institutions as well. You learn from your mistakes. Look at that last teardrop point. Teardrop point. Prevent the prevalent cyber attacks, right? So what does that mean? Well, we probably learn from our experience. Now you guys have your phones out, go ahead and take a picture of this one as well. Here are the, uh, the 18 critical security controls. Uh, as, I go, as I went through these, and by the way, the, uh, the reading just has these listed in a, in a table. And so it's really, there's really not much uh, uh, description about these, and, but they're pretty self-explanatory. So I'm guessing that the uh, association would come up with a series of questions. I mean, they probably wouldn't ask you to say something like, uh, all right, how about number two, inventory and control of software assets. It's probably gonna be a more general question that sounds something like, hey, here are these people, you know, the CIS, and they have these critical security controls. And of these critical security controls, Here's an event, where would that fall inside of these 18 frameworks and standards? And then of course, we can go to the International Organization for Standardization, the ISO. And this is a well-respected, internationally recognized uh, group of really, really smart men and women. And what, what these people do is they do something that is extremely formal. So look at that second uh, arrow point. Helps organize and protect data by providing a framework for identifying, assessing, and managing risk. So, so this thing, let me just go, do I wanna go all the way back here? You know, so here we get this from, you know, those individuals who manage water systems, right? And so this is what they've decided. And to extend that into the framework under which we're having this conversation, under cyber risk management, uh, the ISO then does this for us, right? Now, what did I say earlier? This is formal, you know, so back here, you know, this is kind of well, where I'm, you know, this is kind of uh, a, a generalized framework uh, back here. 
you know, similar things here. What did I say was the important part of this one, you know, to, to go ahead and create a cybersecurity policy. So that gets us started. Here, we get a little bit into more detail. Here, you know, we're still general as well, but when we go to the uh, ISO, they help us to look at that third one, establish policies and procedures. So this, this, this ISO 27,000 is going to get us uh, best practices, you know, commitment to data security and inspires more trust. That makes perfect sense then. All right, how about some essentials? We know this confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Uh, how are we going to kind of impose our control. So here we have these key controls, presentation controls, detective controls, mitigation controls. And then what's fascinating for me from a testing standpoint, I mean, we could easily come up with, you know, uh, a question stem where the three choices are presentation, detective, and mitigation. And you should be able to work through those, you know, based on what we have there just, just in bold. That makes perfect sense. But Remember this operational risk and of course cybersecurity risk and information risk then includes the human element. And so that's why we put this over on the left hand side, uh, focus on human behavior. I, you know, in in uh, with with my example with the baseball bat, boy, if we would have had presentation controls, I'm not sure that would have stopped me. The detective controls, I'm not sure that would have stopped me. Mitigation, that wouldn't have stopped me. But behavioral controls, my mother could have said beforehand something like, uh, you know, Jimmy, you have a lot of strong uh, little kids out there. Maybe they're going to break your bat. How are you going to handle that when you break your bat? And I probably would have said to my mother, ah, my bat's not going to break. Don't worry about it. But at least she would have been, you know, putting that into my brain. So I think the really cool questions are under those behavioral controls. All right. How about the second uh, learning objective? What about what about Equifax? I'm guessing that uh, that you guys remember this. Those of you who read the Wall Street Journal, which should be every one of you every day, will remember that this was in the news for a long, long time. Major data breach. 2017, 148 million Americans, social security numbers, credit card numbers, you know, all sorts of fun things that uh, probably should remain uh, inside of your filing cabinet in your home. Um, failing to patch its system with known vulnerabilities. Ah, that was one of the main reasons why Equifax was fined, you know, five or six hundred million dollars for its negligence. This is a clear case of, you know, we we identified the risks, but we didn't do anything. We didn't do anything about them. And then they had this dedicated fund uh, for several hundred more million dollars. And so I think that's the important part to remember here, negligence. But the, the learning objective asks us to describe lessons. So here we go. Key vulnerabilities. These are the lessons that, uh, that we should learn. And so these are probably going to be the exam questions. Now, I can't imagine that would, that would get into the specifics of Equifax. So they'll make up, you know, they'll make up a, a question stem, you know, Jim's company, and then they'll say something like, oh, you know, here we go. And, and here are five colored arrow points. So poor inventory, what did I say earlier, right? Make a list. You know, if we don't have a list, then we don't have an inventory. So that links us back to what we talked about. What was that about 15 minutes ago? Inadequate enforcement of risk management policies. Oh my gosh, this is the one where I put my hands on my head and I say something like, wait a minute, didn't we just have a bank with three letters, SVB? Didn't we just have a bank that didn't even have a chief risk officer for an extended time period? So if you don't have somebody in charge, how can you have adequate enforcement of risk management policy. So the part of this question will go back to the board of directors, the executive leadership team, and the chief risk officer and his or her team. Now, of course, the association is super interested. We've talked about this in many other recordings about uh, communication. And this comes, this comes directly from the chief risk officer. And this chief risk officer, remember what I've said to you in previous recordings, the chief risk officer's job is to come in and just walk up and down the hallway and say something like, hey, what's the worst thing that can happen today in your office? Oh, let me take some notes there. And then after that conversation, then we write it up and we send it out. 
We send it out inside of your business unit and we send it out all throughout the organization. And we say something like, oh, hey, you know, Ted over there, he came up with this idea. Here's the idea and here we're gonna, here's how we're gonna solve it. How does that relate to what you guys are doing over here? And then we have these uh, possible expired certificates, right? So internet stuff uh, there. We're gonna rely on our technology people to make sure those are updated. And then here's the great one here. No contingency plan. Of course, all the way back, you know, we had the detect and then we had the respond. You know, what are we gonna do? And that's the job of the chief risk officer. What do we do under the worst case scenario? So that takes us through those two learning objectives. Let me go ahead and just remind you that the lessons learned from what we just did with Equifax, that's probably important. And then I think the best practices uh, for managing these information and cyber risk, because we're all gonna be able to provide examples, right? We can do that without having probably even gone through this reading at all. So frameworks and best practices. So, hey, that was fun for me. Thanks for watching and good luck studying.